Well, hello and welcome to episode number 294 of the Plain Talking UK podcast. I'm Carlos and I am not in the PTUK studios this week because I am here at the NevTech studios this week. And, uh, well, joining me here in his own studio here is uh, my co-host, Neville Bounds. Here we are. Yes. <laughs> very well, warm welcome to you. Thanks for driving all the way over today. That was great. And I think you did very well on time considering the Friday night traffic business. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was good. The, M- good. the M25 wasn't too bad today, well, I will say. So, I've done well. Great but, to see you, mate. Yes, yeah, it's just lovely to be here. This is, this is so bizarre. Because we've obviously been in the studio before, but not during a live show. So, mm. this is quite quite nice i like this yep, yep. but how are you Nev? yeah very well thanks yeah another hectic week at work mm-hmm. it's very uh, very full on i'm pleased to say and um yes of course we've got some stuff to talk about that we're doing tomorrow oh tomorrow, yeah so um yes. that will be yeah, very good stuff. so uh yeah really great to be back on the show and um glad it's the end of the week it's been a, a busy week oh, God, i can sure. totally agree with yeah. that it's been, been a, a rather busy week i think mm. in uh, everyone's uh, books has to say so uh joining us as well this week he is in the PTUK studios and hopefully he's going to be pressing all the right buttons this week as he always does it's the awesome Matt Smith yeah you know see that's fine that's fine you just leave me here in the studio all on my lonesome (laughs) I'll tell you what it's really nice when there's only me in here it's really rather spacious I'm not going to (laughs) lie it's lovely and it hasn't got a weird smell in it I don't know what you know that's (laughs) So, Matt, come on, uh, for the benefit of all us here in, uh, yes. uh, in the world of podcast land, yes. how is the new car going? Well, uh, I have to say, it is, uh, it's, uh, I'm still uh, struggling to get over the shock, if I'm brutally honest with you. It, it, it was uh, uh, one of the biggest shocks I've ever got. There we are. I just, just took some video. I was washing it, actually, on the Sunday just gone, which was a, a bit of a, a shock, oh, I think, for cars. There was a neighbour then who was There was, absolutely, a bit shocked. A yeah, shocked that I was washing a car. <laughs> All the time that we've lived there, I've not actually done such a thing. So, uh, there we are. No, it's, it's amazing. It, it's incredible. Uh, I've been... Uh, blown away by everybody's kindness it's just been a it's as i say you get to go from you know uh what we can only describe as an absolutely insane low uh to an unbelievable high all in the space of of seven days is is something i, I shall never get over uh to be honest so yes thank you so very much to everyone who did uh, all, i wasn't speeding i promise by the way here this this was the legal speed limit uh, as i went past carlos's house <laughs> but uh, yeah absolutely it's looking very shiny look you see it got a mm. teacup and a polish as well. Yeah, oh, no. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's, I'm glad. We're, we're all glad. And, uh, yeah, it's nice to see you uh, back on top form again, Mr. Smith. Thank after. you. Yes. Yeah. It's, as I say, it's been been a, a, an interesting seven days. As I say, a very low to ridiculously high. It's just been uh, amazing. Thank you, everyone. Yes. So joining us as well this week, as always, are other illustrious co-hosts of this show. He's the man who does everything to do with aviation and more. It is the awesome... Armando. Hey guys, um, happy to be back for yet another week. I'm actually really excited to hear your announcement to see what you guys are doing this weekend. Super excited for Matt also. That's awesome video. Um, <laughs> glad that uh, that you're enjoying the car, although I still stand by the fact that the steering wheel is on the wrong side. <laughs> oh, <laughs> now, excuse me, you spent long enough here to not be able to make that statement, so pack that in for a start. <laughs> That's great. I hope you got a discount on it. <laughs> Stop it. Anyway. So, about- Armando, I can't, I can't help noticing, Armando, you are um, in another different studio. This <laughs> yeah. Week. Yeah, we're all playing musical chairs this week. Uh, I am at the Statesville, North Carolina airport in the pilot lounge with my portable setup. So we'll see how this goes. Oh, well, it's holding, well, holding good so mm-hmm. far. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. signal's good. So, um, yeah. so what are you doing there, Armando? A bit of flying, a bit of training, a bit of... Um, Flight, yeah, that that's it. Flight? I'm actually uh, flying with a guy today as a safety pilot. So, um, you know, when you got to keep up your instrument currency, you got to have, unless you're actually doing it uh, for a job or in actual conditions, you got to have a safety pilot sitting over there, make sure you don't hit anything. So I am just sitting uh, in the right seat, doing a whole lot of nothing, making sure that the trees don't get any bigger. What's the uh, aircraft of choice, Armando? It is a Cessna 182. Oh, very nice indeed. Very nice indeed. We have actually this week got a, a little story in the uh, news segment, which is a bit of a GA story, which is quite nice. Mm. Just for a change this week, I thought I'd uh, add a GA story Sweet. this week into the show. But, uh, I'm uh, sorry. I, I'm just going to have to interrupt you there, gentlemen. Um, Carlos, that is a fabulous muff that is in front of you. I know. I know. <laughs> 
I shall be. I, shall I, be assume, I assume. I assume. Obviously, never. It's been combed, especially for the purposes of today's show. Yes, I've I've put some <laughs> uh, it. special uh, liquid on it as, as well. Right. Uh, okay. But, um, no. Uh, of course, uh, this is the the, the uh, microphone windshield that we use for our outdoor yes. events as well. And there'll be some outdoor events going on the next couple of days, which we'll tell you about Indeed. later on. Oh, okay. You're going to keep teasing us yet further, right? Okay. So, date and time check, then, everyone. It's uh, well. Let's see. What's the date today, Neil? Fifteenth. Uh, Fifteenth. It is the fifteenth. Friday, the fifteenth. In fact, and it's uh, just coming past five past seven. Uh, seven. Seven in the evening. God, this wine is lovely. Wow. Well. Um, so we've got uh, loads of people in the chat room. All the family members in there, as usual. Big uh, mention, as always. Two. Uh, we've got uh, Rick Bell. Hello to you, uh, Rick Bell. Hello to you, and Matthew Bunting Frame. M- Remember, we had him on the show last week. Uh, we've also got Myla, the lovely Myla. Hello to you, Myla. And we have got uh, Auntie Liz in the chat room. Tanya, uh, Captain Nick is also in the chat room this week. Stephen Hitchin, Dr. Steph, Richard Adams. Uh, scrolling through the list here. Uh, oh, Neville Bounds is in the chat room. That's always never heard of him. Uh, <laughs> uh, Gustav Julison is also in the chat room as well. Hello to you. And Chris Griggs as well hello to you and welcome to everyone who's joined us uh, on the live show tonight so we've got loads to get through military and commercial news and we've also got a very special segment coming up uh, midway through the show uh, which is a special recorder segment that's uh, come from you armando i think isn't it? uh that's correct uh myself and captain nick uh kind of sat around a virtual table to talk about some military times with uh, our friend matt there moderating <laughs> Yeah, I was, yeah I, was, I was just sat there sort of making sure everybody behaved themselves. I, I, I should just stress I wasn't doing anything else. <laughs> Stand, standard job for you then. Uh. Well, quite right, yes, absolutely. Anyway, come on, because we're going to be short of time if not, so should we, should we get on? Oh, okay, fair enough. God, you don't know any... <laughs> well, you, you, two, you two have got flights to catch, all right, you know? Not until tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> yeah, I know, but... So, we are going to start the show then, as we do each week, with our rundown of the weekly news from around the world and the UK. So, if you're ready, Nev. Yes. That was <laughs> quick. <laughs> and if you're ready, Armando. Ready to go. Let's do it. Come on in, Matt. Yeah. So kicking off this week's first news story, this one is on The Scotsman. Uh, dot com and uh, the headline airline boss calls for business class to be scrapped to cut carbon emissions i couldn't agree more you know mm. more more power to the premium economy guys so <laughs> business class flying should be scrapped to cut carbon emissions according to the boss of luton airport's largest airline joseph verdari or Vadiri, uh, chief executive of low-cost carrier Wizz air claimed uh, carrying passengers in premium cabins was outdated he said business class should be banned and these passengers account for twice the carbon footprint of an economy passenger and the industry is guilty of preserving an inefficient and archaic model. A rethink is long overdue and we can uh, call on fellow airlines to commit to a total ban on business class travel for any flight under five hours. Uh, Mr. Vadari uh, urged the aviation industry to be more aggressive in cutting its carbon footprint. He said, if we are truly to make a difference, Wizz Air says it operates the lowest carbon dioxide CO2 emissions per passenger among its competitors and expects to reduce its figure by another 30% over the next decade. Airlines rely on business class travel for a substantial portion of their profits as the tickets can cost several times that of those in economy. BA is among the carriers offering business class on short haul trips. The middle seats in its Club Europe cabins are kept free, increasing the comfort of passengers by reducing their aircraft's capacity. This summer, Wizz Air will uh, overtake EasyJet in having the most seats available for passengers flying from Luton. The airport is also UK's busiest for private jets. And it emerged last week, uh, the Labour Party is considering banning private jets from uh, 2025 if it wins the general election. Ooh, <laughs> yeah. Blimey. Bit harsh. But uh, Nev, I mean, you, you've looked yourself today 
for like a, the price of an upgrade with uh, yes. BA to, <clears throat> to business class. I was in the mood for an upgrade tomorrow and I was going to leave Carlos, you know, in, in, in the back of the bus. Uh, <laughs> and very generously, BA have offered me an upgrade for tomorrow for one leg only. So that's from Heathrow to Dubai for £4,400. What? Is that, now, bus- that business class? Yeah, that's, that's a bit on the high side, <laughs> I, I would say. <laughs> Yeah, you're going to have to moderate your wine intake, Carlos. You're slurring so, already, honestly. The plan, the plan is to turn up looking extra smart tomorrow right, and yeah, see if okay. we can, uh, hope you can blag, an blag away yeah. for a free one. Okay. I have to say, on this, on this story, I, don't, I, I can't see airlines banning business class because it is where they make their money, of course it is. as we all know. And uh, I just put in the chat room uh, that I don't think I would use Luton Airport and business class <laughs> in the in same the sentence. <laughs> I just won't uh, use yeah, Luton Airport actually, ever again. No, no. No. Okay. Right. I mean, some of us, you know, who are, are poor, basically don't have that luxury. <laughs> I've got to be honest, because Luton does uh, probably, for a very good reason, often have some of the best deals. Although actually, South End, because we've been we've been looking at multi flights, haven't we? And um, already booked. Yeah. Oh, all right. Okay. Carlos is booked. <laughs> I'm still looking at uh, multi flights, and actually, South End is offering good deals and stuff at the moment, isn't it? So, oh, who yes. knows? and that's certainly not like going to Luton. <laughs> So moving on to the next story, Matt, for you, and uh, oh, this is classic gold, I think, for Indeed. you. Well, and I'm delighted, obviously, uh, in light of this story, I'm delighted you actually treated yourself to a shower at the top of the show, because uh, 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 if you if you uh, fly with this company, you may well need it. This is the metro.co.uk, and the headline is Ryanair is named UK's filthiest airline in new survey. Mm. So Ryanair, <laughs> stop it, uh, Ryanair has been voted the dirtiest airline in the UK, according to a new study. A survey found that only 42% of the country's passengers rated the company for cleanliness on board uh, the figures come in a new survey of 8,000 people from which travel in uh, in a bid to find the dirtiest airlines one of their investigators boarded a Ryanair flight and reported greasy tray tables soiled headrests and dusty synth window sills they also added that they'd used an ultraviolet oh no never use an ultraviolet light <laughs> to look at how clean the tray tables were and it showed stains that couldn't be seen by the naked eye the Irish company uh, was said to be significantly worse than dozens of other airlines in the same study. In the poll, it said that on average, 8 out of 10, that's 81% of passengers, rated cleanliness positivity across 42 airlines. Uh, 6 in 10 passengers found whiz airplanes to be clean, and only 1 in 10 people rated cleanliness on the airline, along with Spanish company Vueling as poor. Uh, British Airways and EasyJet were both said to have good levels of hygiene on board, while Air New Zealand, Singapore Airlines, uh, Qatar, Cathay Pacific, uh, Swiss and Emirates all scored over 90%, which you'd kind of hope, I suppose, with a sort of a legacy carry anyway. So a total of 63% of people flying with Spanish Airlines at Vueling and Alberia felt cleanliness was good. Uh, Roy, uh, Rory Boland, of which... Uh, who is the travel editor, he said uh, faster and faster turnarounds are one thing but is it unacceptable uh, for some airlines to be cutting corners when it comes to cleaning out their cabins properly, no matter how cheap the airline ticket. Uh, There are steps you can take, either choose your next flight on an airline that has a good uh, track record for cleanliness or equip yourself with some antibacterial wipes Uh, if you're flying Ryanair though a biohazard suit might be more appropriate (laughs) Uh, metro.co.uk has contacted Ryanair for comment but has yet received a response. So there I mean, I must admit, there's been, there's been a few times that, that we've flown with Ryanair, most of which have been to Malta, funnily enough, mm. but um, where I have looked at the, the tray, the, you know, the seat back tray and um, uh, various bits and thought, God, that's a bit grubby. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I, we'll see what it's like tomorrow with BA. Nev. Seamless. And that brings us on to the next story. Oh, what's this? Rather conveniently. Oh, no. (laughs) It's on the Daily Mail, obviously, where we go for our aviation. Oh, quality then. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, it says uh, the following. After splashing out £4,700 to fly to New York with her husband in British Airways premium economy seats, an outraged film producer heading to an awards show claimed she found her seat was stained, covered in crumbs, and had a dirty sock on it. (laughs) A couple of points there. Um, Why are you paying £4,700 for a uh, premium economy uh, seat? 
uh, to begin with. Uh, that's, you know, at least, well, that's business class. That, that's class. even more than business class. <laughs> anyway, let's, uh, let's carry on with the story. Lucy Darwin, 55. Irrelevant, but just put it in there anyway. Says that she spent £4,700 on return tickets to New York for her and her husband, flying premium economy on the trip out and Club World on the return leg. Oh, that's the real story, isn't it? The couple were travelling to the Big Apple for the American Film Institute's annual festival, but they said that they found their seats filthy. They were covered in crumbs, stains, and even someone else's clothes. Uh, she said British Airways just arrived at our premium economy seats to New York, costing £4,700. Have we mentioned that before? Uh, to be greeted by <laughs> filth and someone's sock. Uh, outraged doesn't quite cover it. The film producer tweeted a photo saying the service was a disgrace. She then posted another photo which showed the tray table covered in dark stains Ooh. and more crumbs. Glad we've had our dinner tonight, that's <laughs> all I can say. Uh, the film producer Darwin added it got worse. Cabin staff embarrassed and kind but this really is appalling. BA responded by saying, this certainly isn't what you should expect from us when uh, traveling with us, uh, Lucy. Uh, I'll make sure this is fed back for you. Well, um, the uh, Twitter users responded with their shock at the condition of the seats. Uh, Laura Phillips said, oh, that's disgusting. Thomas Dillon wrote, such a shame. They have trashed the brand in the last few years. Uh, Adrian Grierson blasted, Premium economy is a joke. It's just economy with a meal and a drink holder. I learned that the hard way. Well, we'll let you know about that tomorrow. Well, yes. uh, Lucy Darwin <laughs> was attending the festival in New York to speak about the film. He dreams of giants. Why is that relevant to the story? Um, the movie is about Monty Python stars Terry Gilliam's uh, attempt to complete a film adaption of Don Quixote. She produced the picture and has also worked on Lost in La Mancha and Match Point. Uh, what's that got to do with premium economy? <laughs> Frankly speaking, you should be going Club Europe both ways if, if you're that famous. <laughs> Well, there is that, uh, yes, absolutely. Honestly, um, Armando, do you, do you not think, you know, because obviously the airlines like Southwest and the US are obviously very busy, um, do you not think that it's probably down to other airlines as well having quite quick turnaround times that, the, you know, the crews aren't able to, to do a perfect job? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. And we've talked about it plenty of times where it's not always the crew. It's, it's that third-party company that is yeah. hired by the airline or the airport to do that ground service. And I know that I've, it, it, with some of those quick turns when you're getting off the airplane still and you're watching the cleaning crew it, and three minutes after the door has opened, they're already halfway back. So, you know, they're not, they're not uh, taking their full time, whether that's their fault or, you know, the airline's fault for scheduling them so tight. But yeah, I, I've never really been, well, I, I've never come to expect a you know spotless operating room out of an airplane. I, su I suppose. <laughs> no, no. Uh, Lane, Lane Street has some sound advice for us actually in the chat room here. Uh, he's uh, suggesting that the moral of this story is don't lick your tray table, uh, which I think is is good advice <laughs> for life in general. Uh, certainly. Mm. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, yes. It's... Actually, Auntie Liz in the chat room points out something very important. This is something that I've heard many times, and this is from someone who works within the NHS here in the UK. Mm. But it says here that uh, we need germs in our lives to strengthen our immune systems. That's true. It, no, it, it very is very true. true. And as I say, as I say we've got the, the ultimate Irish uh, comment to go with that, essentially with Owen saying it's all good, clean dirt. Uh, that is that's, that's, that's the ultimate. Well, I like Gustav's. That, yeah. Gustav's comment in the chat room too is, well, maybe that sock was what they were giving you as a, you know, thank you, welcome to premium economy. <laughs> well, yes, exactly. Indeed. Free no, clothing. But, the, but there is something, there is genuinely something to that. You, you do worry sometimes in the fact that, that children especially now grow up in such, this is slightly off topic, I know, but uh, children grow up in such sort of like germ-free um, environments nowadays. I mean, like gone are the days like when, you know, myself, Carlos, Nev, Armando, I'm sure we all went outside and played uh, in mud and, you know, sort of rivers and all that kind of thing. Well, I mean, you know, you could have caught any sort of venereal disease off swimming in the rivers, you know, <laughs> but it's just like, it's, um, you know, as, as, as Auntie Liz says, I mean, the, you know, sometimes you need to be exposed to these things to, to have something to fight back with, don't you? I mean, you can get some cream for it, though. Right. 
Good, lovely. <laughs> but again, you know, um, word to all the listeners: just, just don't lick tray tables. Don't lick. Yes, I think Lane obviously has yeah. na- nailed this. Essentially, don't yeah. lick the tray table. That's that's sign and sound advice. <laughs> so, from licking tray tables to uh, to long flights, uh, Armando. Yeah, talking about being stuck in uh, dirty pressurized tubes for hours on end. Uh, <laughs> following the success of Qantas's nonstop London to Sydney flight the airline wants to implement a move and stretch zone to help passengers handle the 19 plus hour flights. Ultra long flights are increasingly becoming the norm as airlines test the limits of what's possible and the comfort level of passengers. And while the convenience of a nonstop flight is undeniable, no matter how long it is, it's important to stretch and move around to prevent a myriad of issues from sitting in one spot too long. As part of the test, the airline is examining the effects of this kind of long-haul travel on people, and stretching and meditation is part of that. We know that travelers want room to move on these direct services, and the exercises we encouraged on the first research flight seem to have worked really well. So we're definitely looking to incorporate onboard stretching zones and even some simple modifications like overhead handles to encourage low-impact exercises. The London to Sydney flight had about 50 passengers and crew on board, flew across 11 countries, including Germany, Russia, China, and Indonesia, before it crossed the Australian coast near Darwin. The super long flight was met met with a celebration upon landing in Australia, as 2020 marks 100 years of the airline's operations. Earlier this year, Qantas also tested the 19-hour, 16-minute flight from New York to Sydney, during which the staff tracked passengers' health While on board during that flight, passengers got up for a group exercise at their assigned intervals. Uh, While the idea of sitting in one spot and binging on movies is relaxing, it's ultimately very important to get up and move while flying. And that is especially true for ultra long haul flights. Sitting too long can be the cause of, or can cause your feet to swell or cause potentially dangerous blood clots. So one of the best ways to avoid blood clots is to move around a lot. Get up from your seat often and invest in a good pair of compression socks or just one dirty compression sock. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Hashtag orcs. Yeah, I I honestly can't see. I can't see airlines um, implementing a kind of stretch zone within their air. Take take some seats out that earn money. Have a stretch zone. Yeah, it's not going to happen. Is that no? (laughs) Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, the handles. Maybe I could see those. Uh, of course, the picture that accompanies this article has people putting their hands on the overhead bin latching mechanism, so I doubt <laughs> that's very effective. Um, actually, actually, going back to the other two stories here, there's been an interesting observation in the uh, chat room here. Stephen Hitchin has said, story one, reduce space, get more people in, reduce CO2 per passenger. Story two, remove seats, increase space. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And a comment from Nick Anderson that we can't repeat on the No, show. no, never. So Can on. it ever be said out loud? <laughs> no, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, oh, uh, sadly, it's one of those. If you weren't there, guys, you'll have no idea what it was all about. One of the reasons why you should join the chat room, because essentially, uh, Nick is a filth monger, and it's something we all enjoy immensely. So uh, there we go. <laughs> no, that's me in trouble. Uh, sorry. I really shouldn't drink gin and tonic. Gin and tonic is clearly bad. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Uh, so uh, next story <laughs> is uh, on the nzherald.co.nz. So the headline on here, a bit worrying this one, Nev. Uh, former airline worker reveals why you're not getting a flight upgrade. Oh. says here, nothing beats first or business class except first or business class at economy prices. That's why a free upgrade to the pointy end of the plane is pretty much every economy travel. A free dream. upgrade to the pointy end of the plane. <laughs> <laughs> Over the years, ah. uh, they've received plenty of advice on how to increase the chances of a free cabin upgrade, uh, one of which we're never going to try tomorrow. We're mm. going to um, turn up and do a, a comedy act in front of the... Uh, right. okay. um, from wearing uh, dressy that's, clothes... That's surely the fastest way to get bumped off the flight <laughs> altogether, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we're hoping for jump seat privileges. Anyway, right. yeah, yeah. Uh, pretending uh, that we're on a honeymoon... <laughs> what with Nev? Uh, no, not with Nev. No, not until tomorrow. Okay. Um, right. <laughs> and uh, even sweet talking the airline worker at the check-in. I've tried on that one as well. Yeah. 
Um, but they've, form- they've heard it all, haven't they? That's the thing. But oh. a former airline gate agent <clears throat> has revealed the truth about cabin upgrades and how likely it is you'll be plucked from your cheap seat and uh, thrown into a fly flat bed in the front of the aircraft. And it's not good news. So you're really unlikely to get an upgrade unless you're a frequent flyer or pay a premium for your seat. So that uh, means that Nev's going to get one and you're not. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yep. Um, that doesn't stop people. I do beg well, though. Uh, that doesn't stop people trying, though. Honeymooners, engagements, birthdays, injuries are probably the most common stories they hear. Uh, they've also had influencers try to use their status in exchange for an upgrade. Do well, you know who I am? We are, mm. We're from PTUK. Well, yes. we've got the business cards. We should be on the jump seats. We've got right. matches, okay. we've got uh, everything. Again, something that's likely to ensure you never get on the aircraft. <laughs> uh, so perhaps uh, we should not do that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it goes on. It say upgrades may be rare, uh, but sometimes flights aren't full, which means there could be a better seat for somewhere uh, for you somewhere on board, even if you're in economy. Booking systems literally won't let you get uh, let ground staff upgrade a passenger, so asking for one is usually pointless. Uh, but there's nothing to prevent you from being given an extra seat or two if the flight isn't full. They said uh, this is especially useful if you're on a long haul flight and want to stretch out and get some good quality sleep. Uh, they said that uh, not many of will know from experience, but the first and business class seats aren't always the most comfortable seats in the house. While not every airline carries them a sky couch or sleeper seat, which basically converts into a bed, it's a game changer, they said. For a few extra hundred dollars, you get a row of three seats to yourself uh, for your travel party. These couches are also comfortable uh, as well as business class passengers often downgrading so they can recline back fully and get a decent rest. Now, I must admit, I've, I've, I've had this before once on a, on a Delta Airlines flight on a 76 where, I, where we, um, me and Gemma had uh, the centre row of four seats and we had four seats each because mm. the flight was not even half full. And it was quite nice to be able to put the armrests up and, and, and kind of have it as a bed. And I must admit, it was very comfortable. Mm. Mm. Um, to use. I mean, um, I, I suppose it's the ultimate question. I mean, is that invite? Is that arrangement? I mean, obviously you get sort of fancy food and everything if you're in business, etc. Bigger mm. screens and mm. stuff. But you know, if you are flying, would would somebody prefer to have essentially a row to themselves where they can stretch out and have a bit of kip over over paying over the odds for for your business class ticket? Armando. I mean, uh, yeah, I I've been lucky enough to be upgraded a couple times while flying uh, across the ocean but i'm with you i would rather have that uh, that four seats across you know and lay out and make your own little nest in there and yeah i'm I mean, I'll, I won't turn down an upgrade. <laughs> no, I'm no. Be rude not to, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> be very rude. <laughs> yeah. Well, You're reading that, reading that list. I may have tried a couple of those things here and there. Also. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Surely yeah. we're not the only ones, right? I mean, I'm, I must have been married, what, 20 times in the mm. last... Yeah. Have you? Sorry. Right. Yeah. Okay, does Gemma know? <laughs> <laughs> She's always with me. Right. We constantly okay. get married. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, that's, that's, that's nice. It's yeah. only worked once, though. Right. To say. And okay. that was with Emirates. Was it? It, it was yeah. with well, Emirates. See? Okay. There you go. It didn't cost you anything all the other 19 times. <laughs> <laughs> true. 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 That is true. So okay. moving on to the next story then, Max. Yes, and, indeed. Uh, so this is on another website that I've not ever ha- come, come across. It's called sfgate.com. And the headline is stuck with an annoying airline seat, mate. Here's what you can do about it. Um, so this is uh, sound advice for anyone who should be flying on a BA flight to Dubai tomorrow. Uh, airline passengers can be so annoying. How annoying? Just ask Aretha Charlotte, who is a tour guide from Arlington in Vermont. Uh, on a recent flight from Newark to Amsterdam, her seatmate opened her tray table, placed her infant on it, and began to change the baby's diaper. Yummy. Um, you don't need an ultraviolet light to see the state that was in afterwards. It's the most disgusting thing I've ever seen on a plane that... Um, Charlotte says, uh, I didn't know what to do. It's hard to find someone who doesn't have a story like hers to tell. Uh, Charlotte, who writes a blog called Roaming Nanny, says she tries to keep her cool when a seatmate does something really irritating. I think the number, I think the number one thing uh, to remember 
uh, when uh, something weird starts happening is not to lose your temper, she says. I firmly believe that when most people travel, they don't think about those around them. We're all worried about our comfort. Uh, Jacqueline Eust, who is a uh, frequent traveller and president of the Pennsylvania uh, Academy of Protocol, agrees the, uh, that uh, maintaining your composure is the golden rule when it comes to passengers seated behind you, in front of you or next to you. Losing your cool <coughs> excuse me, is counterproductive considering that you're trapped with them in a pressurised tube for the foreseeable future. Don't yell. Hello, whoever's. I'm going to just turn those that lot down. Somebody's uh, adjusting something. Uh, don't yell, she says. Uh, this will only make the rest of your travel experience tense. So what are the most aggravating things passengers do? Um, and what can you do about them? The problems are numerous and varied as the solutions. If there's a common thread, it is stay above the fray. Otherwise, you could end up uh, starting uh, start, or starring in a viral video or worse. Uh, so I asked Marianne uh, for her thoughts on babies in flight. A crying baby can be annoying, says Perez, uh, the CEO of uh, Babe Voyage. Uh, a sight for parents who travel with young children, but the absolute wrong reaction is berating the parent or caretaker for having a crying baby. Parents want their baby to stop crying more than the other passengers. Instead, offer to help or try distracting the baby. Maybe you have a cute video on your phone or you could show um, that you could show the baby or you may have something entertaining like a colourful keychain. Uh, infants are hardly the only passengers who can grate on your nerves. Consider the situation Lisa found herself in on a recent flight from Los Angeles to Rome. Soon after the flight attendant served a snack, a passenger seated across the aisle calmly removed his shoes and began clipping his toenails. His seatmate, uh, her face buried in a book, didn't react. Uh, Cortez, who is a secret f uh, tr air flyer who runs a tour company in Phoenix, waited in vain for the seatmate to react. I grabbed my uh, tablet computer from the side pocket of my seat and set it to a standing position as a barrier between flying toenails and my yummy midnight mid-flight snack. Uh, sometimes that's all you can do, protect yourself from whatever a fellow passenger sends your way. And then there are the seat reclining passengers. Oh, the seat recliners. Cat, uh, an actor and improv consultant from Albany, New York, um, had on her last flight it would have been easy to react mindlessly she said i could have passively aggressively bumped her seat a lot instead she applied the principles of improv and used the moment as an opportunity to stretch her performance range cycling through possible responses i could tap her on the shoulder politely explain that i had a deadline and ask her to move up uh, she says if i could see uh, if the flight attendant might be able to help me i could choose not to work and find out um how that decision might lead to other options like uh, meditating or listening to music. She could also vow never to fly on an airline with such a uh, <laughs> scarcity of legroom ever again, or book a ticket on an airline carrier that limits seat reclining such as Delta Airlines. In the end, she suffered in silence, as most of us do. Uh, in fact, actually, the only seat, uh, the only flight upgrade I ever actually got um, was flying to New Zealand. This was a very, very long time ago, uh, flying to New Zealand, and uh, on the the way um, out, uh, the person in front of me literally, as soon as uh, the seatbelt sign went off, reclined the seat directly behind that was directly in front of me, so close, and literally the monitor was there in front of my face the whole for the whole journey. And um, when the cabin crew came down to ask them to, you know, they weren't being fair because obviously I couldn't move. I, it was all I could do to get in and out of my seat. Um, and they basically told the the cabin crew to go away. Um, and I was, I just sort of said, you know, don't worry about it. It's not worth it. I'll, I'll manage and stuff. And but it was lovely because they spelt, they, they sort of treated me like royalty after that. So like, I said, you know, as long as you don't mind me just getting up, stretching my legs, you know, perhaps sort of wandering. So I kept wandering sort of back to the galley and, and things during flight where they were constantly throwing me free, free food, and I ended, even ended up with a free glass of champagne and all that kind of thing. So sometimes actually helping the cabin crew is the best thing you can do because they'll, they'll sort of, you know, be nice to you. I know. I know several people actually who uh, quite often bring chocolate uh, for the cabin crew when they're flying somewhere. Uh, yeah. That's quite Probably a common, common common thing, isn't it? But uh, yeah, it actually, was... we we'll put it, we we'll put it out to the to the crew. Uh, we'll start with you, Armando. The most annoying passenger you've ever had sit beside you. Go on. Oh, without a doubt, on Virgin Atlantic from Heathrow to... I, I, I love how there's already a story that immediately pings to mind. <laughs> yeah, no, it, I mean, we all have them, but this one, 
stands out in my head. It, and and uh, I, I think I was going from Heathrow to Washington Dulles, or maybe it was um, Charlotte Direct or something like that. And there was this man, and I, I swear he hadn't bathed ever in his life. And he was right in the seat next to me. So I was in that middle row of four. And he, I mean, he, he ate his food like it was a a wild animal feeding on a carcass. Uh, it smelled sort of along the same lines. <laughs> wow. And then there was the bodily functions that came along with all of that. And, and it was a packed flight. I could not go anywhere, but it was one of those things. And this is what I was thinking about when you were reading that story was, you, you know, when, when everybody around that person is doing the same look, like they're yeah. all looking or peering over the seat to the crying baby. I mean, or the you'd, stinky... you'd think they'd feel the burning. Do you know what I mean? From the other person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Clueless. laughs> so come on Clueless. in, Matt. Well, I've, I've just told mine. It was, as I say, it was that, that, uh, that incident where, you know, where the, 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 the lady passenger in front of me immediately fully reclined her seat and then out and out refused to do anything but leave it exactly where it was. Um, as I say, it had a very nice upgrade. Uh, up, I got an upgrade on the way home, believe it or not. They'd sorted out an upgrade for me. Uh, the cabin crew had obviously had a word with someone or the pilot or someone like that. And uh, I actually UTK got... status. Sorry? One of this was this was, this was before you'd even came up with this crazy idea. This was this, oh, okay, as I say, this was this was this was before I developed a they fear knew. of flying. You know, it was that <laughs> long ago. Um, and uh, yes, they they um, but the cabin crew were amazing. And when I went to go and check in on the way home, so it was only for the first leg um, from New Zealand to to Kuala Lumpur. This was with uh, Malaysian uh, air, Airways uh, airlines, and um, yeah, I had a free upgrade. Um, waiting for me at the check-in desk. I went to check in as normal, and they said, "I'm terribly sorry, sir. You've gone. You've come to the wrong desk." And I'm like, "Well, no. This is, this is the one. You know, the one that I booked, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And then, uh, and they said, "No, you need to go over there." And that was it. They bumped me up to business class as a sort of with a, with a lovely little note that said, um, um, "You know, sorry, you had such a bad flight um, in," which Nev. was lovely. Heathrow to Madrid, 2001, oh. BA business class. There I am, minding my own business in 1C, which is obviously a bit of a downgrade. Yeah, I can say, what happened to 1A? <laughs> uh, but um, my fellow passenger was in 1A, someone that I didn't know, and he was in a rush to, to get to his next flight, clearly. Um, we've barely uh, taken the high-speed exit off the runway at Madrid, <laughs> and he's up trying to get his case out of the overhead locker. As you can imagine, the crew were not that impressed. No. With them and explained to him that he has made an error and that he should sit down because we're still doing about 60 knots coming steaming off the end My of the, uh, uh, the taxiway there. Uh, anyway, so he finally sits down. Uh, but of course, the, the moment we, we turn on to the stand and it's uh, doors to manual, he's up again and he's trying to get the blasted thing out of the... Uh, overhead locker um so you would think he was in a rush but no um when we eventually got off the plane um i went up the jetty to the terminal and he's there on his phone talking about this that and the other words you know so there was there was no rush at rush all to get somewhere else from his yeah. point of view but uh, he just uh, um made it very difficult for his uh, fellow passengers and C myself carlos well. what about you uh, for me, it's, it's definitely got to be a similar one to Armando. Um, sat next to someone, and this was on a flight from Heathrow to Dubai with Emirates in economy. And the gentleman sitting next to me um, obviously hadn't visited a showering room for some okay. time. Okay. Oh, lovely. And um, <laughs> and it was you know you know you know when it's that kind of really pungent kind of oniony. Mm. You, Onion, you know, that kind of smell. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> and basically, what I done to to get myself through it was I drank copious amounts of red wine, which is obviously offered to you on board the the flight. Right. And fell asleep. 
Okay, I mean that's one way of dealing with it. Certainly, absolutely. I'd say, in fact, actually, uh, guys, uh, seriously, those you, those of you listening to this, why don't you send in to us uh, by email, podcast at plaintalkinguk dot com. That is podcast at plaintalkinguk dot com. Why don't you send in your airline horror stories, um, and uh, and we'll read them out in next week's show. So yes, yeah, so uh, uh, yes, yeah, so, okay. We we can also do WhatsApp uh, as Carlos says. So it's plus four four seven five seven double two four nine one double six that's plus four four seven five seven double two four nine one double six um but or podcast at plain talking uk.com and we'll read some of them out on next week's show so next up Yes, on the airline ratings.com. And this is an interesting take on the A380 because mm. the poor A380s had a lot of, a bit of a stick bashing. recently, isn't it? And um, it's interesting to see what uh, Emirates uh, says about this. Now, of course, Emirates was the sole driving force behind the A380. It's a 113th a380 was delivered on november the 11th and seven aircraft are still to come before the program is finally shut down well emirates president sir tim clark has always been a strong advocate of the 380 and says that airbus will rue the day it cancelled the super jumbo program an exclusive interview with and andreas spaith in berlin on the eve of his upcoming 70th birthday and ahead of the dubai air show watch this space for later yeah. on. Uh, he reflected on the past present and future of the a380 in the first of a two-part series uh, the ceo uh, of air france has recently disqualified the a380 as having always been difficult and now obsolete what is your take on this he was asked well uh, clark says the A380 was a misfit for Air France. They never scaled. They only ever had 10 aircraft. Yes, we faced the same teething problems, but we dealt with them because we were scaled enough to deal with it. If you've got a sub-fleet of 10, it's a nightmare, and the costs go through the roof, and uh, they're absolutely right. But if you've got 100 of them, it's a bit different. Your unit costs in operating with that number are a lot lower than just having 10. Secondly, look at their interior. What did they actually do to shock and awe the market community with that A380 when it came to market? Why was it that Emirates, who took, out, who took it after Singapore Airlines, uh, that it lit up the planet in terms of showers and bars and big TV screens? We did it for a very well calculated reason, not to blow our own trumpet, but simply we had a huge risk and huge investment. To belittle that investment by putting in a business class seat of 1990s uh, and a first class uh, 1980s, think, and economy class seating and IFE of 1990s, was not something we would have done like Air France. The whole approach to the A380 at Air France and Lufthansa was just more of the same. They lost the opportunity to really define it. They never ordered any more. British Airways didn't order any more. BA should have had the same number of A380s as we have, hundreds of those. They've got 62 million people in the UK and a congested Heathrow hub. That should have worked easily. Uh, the other question he was asked was, where would Emirates be today without the A380? Well, he says, uh, Tim Clark, we would have faced slot compression at Dubai. We would operate a lot less ton and seat kilometers than we are today. That's why we are the largest international airline in the world, because we have 113 A380s. If you look at the economic landscape of the mid-1990s into which the A380 was born, it was absolutely the right thing to do. Nothing wrong with it. From concept to delivery, it took Airbus 12 years. That's too long, that cycle in our business, is, and it's dangerous. Unfortunately, it then came at exactly the wrong time, which is a pity. He was then asked, would a different timing for the A380 have made a difference? And he says that in the mid-1990s, demand for air travel was skyrocketing. Margins were very strong, and we could see our slot constraints, constraints at London Heathrow were really biting us in the backside. And uh, that's exactly what's happening now. I've got six sorry, A380s daily into Heathrow, and they are all full. If I had never built bigger uh, A380-900s with the same six slots I get, 
they would be full as well. Uh, the A380 came into service with us in 2008, uh, which was when fuel prices skyrocketed to 145 US dollars per barrel. Uh, between 2008 and 2010, the airline industry went into meltdown, and this aircraft never had a chance as the people in charge at the top were the world's biggest airlines and they were very risk averse. It was Emirates that kept the whole thing going. It was unlucky. Uh, had it come in 2004, you would have had more orders then, but maybe it needed someone like me to persuade our shareholder to buy 150 of them. Most carriers were buying three, four or 10 if they were lucky. So I would say- He knows his stuff. Well, he? he does. And he's got a very good point there because if you're gonna go large, with a large aircraft, then you've got to do it the way that Emirates have oh, done yeah. it. And, and just taking, you know, 10 or a dozen examples is, is not going to do it. And, and frankly, if it wasn't for Emirates, um, Air, um, Airbus wouldn't have a, a program. I mean, Emir three, Emirates I have been doing this for years now, haven't they, with yeah. the 380? And it, and it obviously works because they're continuing to, like I said, the story says, they got their last one in November mm. this year. So they're still obviously having new ones delivered, but they are you know, they've obviously got it right. Yeah, absolutely. And they must be making money. And I think it's, as you, as they were saying in the article there, it's, it's no just good having just more of the same. You need to make a, a big differentiator. And yes, there are limited airports that it can go into uh, around Europe, but uh, they're all pretty big major hubs and um, they need, need to fill the seats, don't they? Mm. Mm, so. True. That's very true. So moving on to the next story, Armando. Yeah, so this story is from simpleflying.com. Uh, a common problem for most billionaires is sometimes your private jet needs to go in for an oil change. But how will you visit your private island on the other side of the world? Surely not commercial. You will be surprised how luxurious first class can be on these top carriers. So according to Simple Flying, their top five in no particular order is uh, ANA's uh, 777-300ER first class. They were blown away when ANA revealed their refreshed first class cabin concept called Eats, Eats, <laughs> East Meets West, uh, featuring a private suite with a 43-inch 4K monitor. In fact, you could not fit in a bigger TV screen. The suite features a door, so your privacy is guaranteed. I'm going to go with almost guaranteed. <laughs> Uh, let's see, next one is Air France's 777-300ER, La Première class. Uh, often unmentioned first class suite is Air France's take on the concept. First, passengers are driven to the plane in a private car, skipping the boarding with the commoners entirely. <laughs> Each seat has four windows to itself, a bespoke white styling, exquisite onboard tasting menu, and a private floor to ceiling curtain that offers uncomplicated privacy. Uh, the next one is Emirates, Boeing 777-300-300ER, first class. Uh, Emirates comes in third with their take on their first class cabin with 40 square feet of private space, a 32-inch television screen, which you can video chat to your flight attendant, and visual, reali visual reality windows. The seat features a zero gravity position to give you a feeling like you're floating amongst the clouds. This cabin also features some of the only floor-to-ceiling privacy doors found in the air. Uh, Emirates is also notable for having an excellent first-class product on its A380 aircraft. Uh, next one is Singapore's A380 first-class suite. Starting this journey is the uh, Singapore A380 first-class suite. This private suite is around 50 square feet, features a standalone lie-flat bed, a rotating recliner chair, a 32-inch TV screen, not unlike found in most lounge rooms, and amazing dining options. Plus, if you're traveling with a companion, the two suites can be joined to create a 100-square-foot palace with a double bed. Wink, wink. Uh, <laughs> Etihad's A380, The Residence. Oh, yeah. The number one most luxurious first-class experience is Etihad's The Residence aboard their A380. The residence features a living room, a double bed, your very own personal butler. Other first class guests need to share the shower on board, but you get your own bed to be used as many times as you would like. So uh, for some videos and pictures, head over to simpleflying.com and uh, 
you can see how the other half lives. <laughs> just, yeah. something that's, just something. Or that's Nev. Stuck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah One thing that stuck out for me in that story, and I think you'll agree, Nev. ANA with 4K TVs. Mm. Is that the price of it or the resolution? Yeah. <laughs> yeah the price, I reckon. <laughs> mm, yeah. Could be. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, as IFE goes, you know, you're used to your kind of Minecraft yeah, monitors. But are they really going to be playing 4K content, content or is yeah. it going to be upscaled I mean, VHS? Sh sh sure, surely the, the infrastructure required to be able to do 4K, deliver 4K to those monitors is, is quite a data. Bandwidth. Well, it's, you know it's what I mean? either going to be very big um, uh, copper or fiber, isn't it, to deliver that resolution to the <laughs> screen? Uh, but um, and here the whole time I thought it was just an HF wire antenna trailing yeah. out the back of the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but they are doing it properly, aren't they? Well, you know, I, I'm joking apart. I think they've they've got a really good uh, product there, and uh, that, that's going to be really well received. I mean, the picture on that story for the INAs first class suite that the tv the 43 inch tv takes up the entire wall back wall or front oh, sorry the front wall mm. in that suite yep it's you <laughs> nice. i'll do yeah I'll yeah do i was trying to put i was there. trying to put the picture up but it, it's been um it's been playing up but i will have bit. to i will say though out of all of those the one that i really would love to try is that residence mm. with Etihad yeah. in the 380. Oh, yeah. That is what I doubt the height of... Uh, we should have put that tomorrow yes. instead, shouldn't we? None <laughs> yeah. of this. Because that'll be really I, cheap, I, yeah. I did no, I did do a price check on that probably a year ago, and we you know when they just after they bought out this residence thing. I think it was about £14,000 one way mm. from Heathrow to Dubai. Yeah, it's a bit hot on that. Mm, it's quite a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Start saving now. Right. Okay. What for <laughs> for the Dubai Air Show next year? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Can you imagine what any of our spouses would say if we just saved up fourteen thousand pounds and then spent it no, on one, no, like, one where, flight? Where, where you yes. made the slight mistake there is Armando. We we wouldn't be telling them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never yeah I know, but 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 fourteen thousand. I mean, I mean, I'm, yeah. you know, I'm all for a bit of creative accounting, but yeah. fourteen thousand pounds. How are you going to hide that kind of money? Well, you're Jeez, not. This are identity you? identity theft is rampant these days. Anyways, <laughs> I'm going it? to Dubai. <laughs> right. Okay. Anyway, good to let's let's hope none of your spouses are currently watching. <laughs> so the next story is on the Forbes.com website, and uh, <laughs> this one's quite good because this one is um, is is freebies. So uh, Hawaiian Airlines surprises a passenger with ninety thousand miles to mark their 90th anniversary. Mm. That's quite a nice mm. gift. Hawaiian Airlines marked its special occasion this week, uh, their 90th anniversary of its uh, first flight from Ao, 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 to Maui. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. There we go. Thank you, Armando. Uh, which took place on the 11th of November, 1929. Uh, the flight this week, HA1111, traveled on the same day, the same route and time as the original flight to Parton. Uhu at 9:35 a.m. and arriving at uh, Kahulu Airport in Maui on at 10:17 um, on a Boeing 717. Those passengers who were lucky enough to snag a seat for as low as $59 a few weeks ago were treated to a few surprises during the flight. The first and most generous of those gifts was of 90,000 Hawaiian Airlines miles. Each of them received for just being on board. They also what? given birthday cards, a copy of the November 11th, 1929 issue of the Honolulu Star Bulletin um, with the airline's original flight on the cover. Uh, though back then it was called the Inter-Island Airways. Flight attendants oversaw the cabin dressed in colourful vintage uniforms dating from the 1960s and 1970s and 1980s, while performers treated flyers to traditional Hawaiian music and dances. Uh, the airline also hosted a special plane pull competition and fundraisers benefited sustainable coastline Hawaii and grassroots local nonprofit organizations that help communities organize beach cleanups. It's always a good thing. Over 70 teams of 12 people each tested their strength to see who could haul one of the airline's Boeing 717s. 
Um, they've got tw or 12, or 12 feet. They had to pull the aircraft 12 feet in the shortest amount of time. I'm sure we'd have had a go at that. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> um, along with Hawaiian Airlines employee teams and United Airlines, Alaska Airlines, FedEx, Hyatt Hotels and Bank of Hawaii all competed. As for the other milestones in the airline's history, um, there's a few facts here from the last 90 years. Though the airline's first flight was in November the 11th, 1929, it was actually incorporated on January the 30th, 1929, under the name Inter-Island Airways. It already carried 10,000 passengers in 1930, its first full year operation, and passengers on flights back then were given Wrigley's chewing gum mm. to help relieve Ooh, a luxury air, item. their pressure from altitude changes. Hawaiian Airlines' oldest aircraft is actually a 1929 Bal Balancia. Balancia? Balancia. Balanca. Balanca. There we go. Thank you, Armando. CH300 pacemaker. Back then, passengers could pay $5, the equivalent of around $50 today, for a short scenic flight over Oahu. Uh, the airline has restored five passenger 300 horsepower monoplanes, which it has fabric uh, covered frames and wooden wings and can still fly today. So I can tell you what, 90,000 points. I mean, what would happen if BA gave you 90,000 of your. Um, is it Avios? Yes. Well, would that, uh, would that actually get you anything, Nev? Yeah, it would. Yeah, <laughs> probably as economy fair to um, Glasgow or right. Belfast oh, wow. or okay. something like that, or a, or one of those um, free uh, gifts that they give give away a pen or something like that. Mm. So, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So basically, well, what you're saying is to get anything decent, you need millions. Well, it's not just the Avios points; it's the whole you know status program as, yeah, as okay. well you know oh, but uh, yeah the, the, in the good old days um when i was with uh, flying with sas a lot backwards and forwards to sweden uh, i was a gold card holder for quite a few years actually and we had some really good gifts and some really useful um points to use for, for flying and stuff like that but um they've all uh, cottoned onto it and they're <laughs> just making yeah. sure that they're not too generous these wow. days. have you uh, had any good treats for air miles i'm on uh, no, I've always quickly traded them in for trips and tickets. Ah, okay. So you've used them wisely then? Uh, yeah, I, I try. But, you know, I'm not like Nev. I'm always just struggling for a seat in 68F and, or just <laughs> a cargo hold. I don't even that, that number, I'm afraid. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's where the elevator is. That makes the uh, right. front okay. of the airplane go up and down. Yeah. So, so the next as, story, as you do. Visions yeah. of that. Matter. <laughs> yeah. The uh, next story, Matt, for you is um, it's actually a, a covering a story we, we had a few weeks back. But yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this is our, the yeah. Point Sky website, and the headline is United Airlines unveils first wide body with its new blue swoop. So this post contains references to product. No, no, no sorry, I didn't mean to read that. Uh, United Airlines has painted its first wide body jet, a Boeing 767-300 ER, in the updated livery it unveiled in April. The 767 registration November 67, sorry, November 676 uh, Union Alpha is the latest aircraft to wear the new look that already adorns a number of narrow body aircraft in the Chicago based carrier's fleet. Uh, that includes Airbus 3 A319s, Boeing 737s, Bombardier, um, uh, CRJ 550s and Embraer's E175s. Uh, United plans to repaint the entire fleet in about seven years or by 2026, probably just in time to update the logo again. Anyway, United's uh, updated globe livery uh, utilises shades of blue and grey while dropping the gold that is inherited from the Continental Airlines when the carriers merged in 2010. Uh, the look also embraces the swoop below the windows that first adorned the Boeing 787s back in 2012. It's the biggest canvas that we have to symbolise and summarise who we are about connecting people and uniting the world, United CEO Oscar Mont Munoz said in April. Wide body Boeing 777s and 787s painted in United's new livery are expected to join the 767s uh, in the coming months. Photos of the 777s and the 787s with a new look are visible uh, Look visible on the tails have been circulated on social media. Uh, the first 767 wearing United's new look re-entered passenger service on Tuesday. Operating flight UA 76, uh, sorry, 676 from Newark Liberty to Houston Intercontinental according to the website Flight Award. 
where the uh, jet is scheduled to fly to Sao Paulo uh, and Washington Dulles or Dulles or whatever it is uh, through <laughs> Thursday. So there I we are. I wonder why they chose to, to do this with the 7.6. And mm. not, and not one of their it seems new, like a uh, waste of money, doesn't it? Given that they're all coming well, no, out. Of I mean, service. the seven six I mean, is, a, is a lovely aircraft. You know, there's, there's no two ways yeah, about I, it. But yeah, I just thought they would have chosen one of their shiny new dream. I thought that a seven eight seven would be the ideal aircraft yeah. for that. No, yeah, no, odd. Hmm. Yeah. Indeed. And the whole pin scheme is just kind of meh. Yeah, you're not a lover of the United uh, new. No, you know, they built it up so much and everybody was expecting something revolutionary. Yeah, it's and it's, kind of, it's really not that massively different to what was there already. Is it? They've basically just taken the gold yeah. out, haven't they? Um, yeah, and like, they made I it like swoopier. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, am I the only one who sort of thinks it's a bit of a shame in the fact that, you know, people aren't, you know, experimental with their, their liveries anymore? They're, it's it's all very generic nowadays, and it's basically the tail fin and then maybe some lettering along the, you know, sort of towards the front of the plane, and then you usually sort of paint the engines the same colour as the fin, and that's about about it do you know what i mean i mean this is this is why i love like you know a and a so much because they they do do proper raps don't they where you know like they did um star wars, oh, the ones, star didn't wars they? yeah ones, absolutely yeah. and yeah. Uh, you, you you know is it just me who thinks that everybody's playing a little bit too safe these days i think norwegian have got it nailed because mm. on their aircraft their their um short haul the seven threes they have the famous people from uh, norwegian um, history mm -hmm. yeah, on the tails of their aircraft, which is quite nice, mm, just with a date yeah. and stuff on there, which yeah. is good. Yeah, yeah. And when when BA was doing their retro liveries this year, I mean, we kind of covered some videos of how much work and effort, and it's got to be just tens of thousands of dollars to paint an airplane. So I'm sure it has to do with economics, also, where they're just going for you know whatever the cheapest way to to uh, paint an airplane that still represents their brand. Basically, what it's all about is less paint makes it go quicker. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Makes you wonder about. I, I've always wondered about spirit, and if there's just a deal on yellow paint, like nobody else buys <laughs> yellow paint. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's knockoffs. It's, it's cheap, but going I mean, cheap. Who would have yeah. their vehicle painted yellow? That's ridiculous. Oh, I mean, who <laughs> would have their vehicle painted a Seriously? banana color? Can well, you imagine? Well. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. the next story, moving on, is a bit of a GA one this mm. week, just for a change. Just yes. Change. Now this is it's one of those sort of you know bad day at the office uh, stories, but it's got a, a happy ending. It's on the Leicester Mercury, and it says that a pilot was forced to carry out an emergency landing at. Leicester Airport after realising that his plane's landing gear had failed. The Cessna 177 Cardinal came down in a f on a field next to the Stoughton's aerodrome's uh, main runway. Uh, but despite the light aircraft's exhaust and propeller digging into the ground during the impact, the 30-year-old pilot, who was flying alone, managed to escape with only minor injuries. According to a report by the Air Accidents Investigation Branch, the drama in the sky unfolded during a morning flight from Leicester to Northamptonshire on Sunday the uh, 16th of June this year. It stated that the aircraft departed from Leicester Airport on a short flight to Sywell Aerodrome, uh, and we know someone that uh, operates from Sywell, don't we? Um, after departure, the pilot noticed that it took a much greater time for the landing gear to retract than was normally the case. At Sywell, uh, the pilot positioned for landing and selected the landing gear down, but he noticed that neither the green light which indicated the landing gear was down and locked nor the red light which indicated the landing gear was up was illuminated he commenced to go around from his approach and circled near the airfield while completing the emergency checklist the pilot attempted to manually extend the gear using the emergency hand pump but the pump had no pressure and the pilot felt no resistance to his movements uh, the pilot decided he would return to Leicester because he was more familiar with that airport and was aware that it had a smooth grass strip he could land on. Having returned to Leicester, the pilot completed a low approach and go around so that people on the ground could confirm the position of the landing gear, which could be seen hanging down but not locked. Uh, he then began his approach onto a grass runway. Uh, the report says at approximately 100 feet, he shut down the engine, but the propeller continued to windmill. Touchdown was smooth, but the exhaust and propeller dug into the runway, bringing the aircraft to an abrupt stop. 
Uh, the pilot received minor injuries and was taken to hospital as a precaution. The aircraft itself suffered only slight damage to the exhaust and propeller. Crash investigators learned that the Cessna, which was 48 years old, had been re um, uh, recently at a maintenance facility due to a problem with the hydraulic pressure in the landing gear system. A leak was discovered and fixed with repeated testing had shown the issue had been successfully resolved. That the AI AIIB report said that landing gear failure leading to the crash landing resulted from an aluminium tube within the hydraulic landing gear having become detached either through age, uh, over tightening or repeated movement which resulted in the total loss of hydraulic fluid from the system. Uh, but the good news is, is that he put it down on the grass and he walked away from it. And uh, that is the main thing. And also it just goes to show as well, doesn't it? Uh, in the world of GA, if you can get back to a familiar airfield, uh, that is a big plus, isn't it? I I've say. never had the chance to fly a, a GA aircraft with a, with a retractable gear. Mm. I'd, I'd like to have a go though. Um, yes. Armando, have you ever had the uh, chance to fly the 177 Cardinal? I have, yeah, and uh, 180, uh, Cessna 182 retractable gears, 172 RGs, 177 RGs are notorious for having a terrible uh, landing gear system. Um, they have a lot of problems. A lot of the Centurions, the uh, 210s, have uh, modifications to the gear. They're just, uh, it's a complicated, real interesting system that, you know, relies on gravity and stuff. But by all accounts, yeah, this guy did exactly what he needed to do. And uh, that airplane will fly again. It, you know, I'm looking at, at the pictures there and uh, he did everything perfect. Even that, that propeller, you know, stopped horizontally. Yeah, it was probably windmilling after he shut the engine down. But they're, they're pretty gentle, gentle little beasts, um, the Cessna, so you can glide it down and everything that I've ever read or, or heard stories about people putting a, an airplane with the gear up. Um, it's soft on pavement. It's probably even softer on, on grass like this. So uh, good job to the pilot for following his procedures and trying everything he knew. I, I was in a similar situation. I took off from Elk City, Oklahoma in my Lance Air and almost immediately I smelled hydraulic fluid and uh, the gear took forever to retract. Um, so well, I knew there was a hydraulic leak somewhere in the airplane and uh, I left the gear down. So it had a free fall mechanism and uh, landed, got three, three green, landed back in Elk City. And sure enough, as soon as I stopped the airplane, pulled out the seat and it was just covered, everything was covered in hydraulic fluid from a, a, a burst pipe underneath the seat. So. It happens. It's, um, yeah. Indeed. So from uh, one landing gear issue then, Armando, to uh, the next story, which is yours, which is uh, another slight issue with uh, landing gear. Yeah, from, uh, from the Independent, uh, a plane's passenger landing gear burst into flames as it, at, uh, after it touched down. Uh, of course, I get an ad right in the middle of it. Of course it. you do, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> That's how this uh, works. Let's see. After, after it touched down uh, at an airport in Egypt, the Boeing 737-800 had just landed at Sharm el-Sheikh Airport in, uh, on Saturday, carrying 196 passengers and crew. CCTV showed it, footage showed the plane coming to a stop as the wheels on the left side caught fire. The flames can be seen to intensify as smoke billows from the landing gear and emergency crews rushed forward. They quickly extinguished the fire before it could spread. Egypt's Civil Aviation Ministry praised the ground crew for their quick reaction. Uh, the ministry said the fire could have turned into a disaster and was caused by a hydraulic oil leak. Uh, the flight from Zaporizhia in Ukraine was operated by Sky Up Airlines all 189 passengers and seven crew were safely evacuated with no injuries. Yeah, and I watched the video for this one and uh, the plane was all the way back to the stand. Uh, so it had uh, somehow, you know, made it off the runway with full braking and all the way back into the stand. And then it caught fire, which could have been disastrous. I mean, that's not amazing, just really, isn't it? You, you sort of think, I mean, yeah. that, that could have been a very, very different sort of story, couldn't it? If... Uh... If it had sort yeah. of gone according to you know the, the, these terrible things, I'm trying I'm trying to play the video now. Look, 
Um, so this yeah, is from and you'll the watch, CCTV, yeah. Yeah, so you're watching the video. The fire flares up on the left main, and um, the tires on these airplanes are under such immense pressure that they any hot break situation could be um, – very dangerous for ground personnel or if you're walking around because mm. the air, the tires will explode and oh wow uh, look at that can, yeah absolutely there it goes so you'll see here in the video that these folks are quick on their feet and they pick up some fire extinguishers and approach the left main and, and douse that fire uh, putting themselves in 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 danger getting that close so uh, i i if it was me i, I would definitely um show my appreciation to that ground crew absolutely they've got some fusible plugs haven't they uh, when it reaches a certain temperature uh, that they do actually uh, explode is not quite the right word but they they do give way don't they so yeah uh, because the, the the tires are pumped up such high high pressure anyway so yeah uh, but, indeed. Uh, yeah no good, good job by everybody there yeah so, an yeah. amazing yeah. achievement now uh, uh, listen guys uh, armando's got to go um so what uh, we're going to do is we're going to move straight on if that's okay with everyone to a very special interview that uh, armando did uh, and the, this is really sort of in keeping and, and in thinking because it was actually the the couple of day it was the day after um armistice day wasn't it here in the uk yeah that's right um last year uh captain nick did a fantastic uh segment called the unknown warrior it played out on apg we played it and then matt you posted it again this year that that's hard to beat he, he just did a fantastic job and when i was uh, kind of Thinking about the, our our little community, I couldn't have thought of a better person to sit down and have a virtual beer with, and just talk about their time in the military, what it meant to them, what it means for their family, their friends, and what what it should mean for the general public uh, as we celebrate Veterans Day and Remembrance Day. Um, so I got a chance to sit down with Nick, and and I would have loved to have done it at a pub. There in the UK, over <laughs> over a pint, and Definitely. well, I've probably been a, a couple pints, but uh, at least we yeah. just had, yeah. So we got a nice a, a nice chat in, and and Matt was gracious enough to record it. So if you're ready, let's play it out. Thanks for being here. Uh, oh, that's, well, that's no problem at all. It, it's an important time of the year for me, and for many, including obviously yourselves, and. Uh, uh, many other people who, you know, feel that we owe something to those who fought. So I'm a great believer in making sure that we keep their memory alive. Yeah, and, and last year you did a, a great segment on Remembrance Day, and I think we played it out on, on PTUK, and I ended up showing it to quite a few people just because it was so well done. Um, so thank you for producing that because it, it really was, it really captured the, sort of the essence of, of Remembrance Day and why it's important. Yeah, I think we've forgotten a lot of the wonderful details that uh, uh, that happen in events such as that, the choosing of the uh, uh, of the unknown soldier. Uh, and uh, it was, I thought it was great to bring it back to life again. It was fabulous. And uh, Matt did a lovely job of editing that and added the music and uh, uh, made it uh, very poignant. Yeah. So one of the things that I always struggled with in, in the military and now even in, in my post-military years is just the phrase, thank you for your service. So that, that's one of the things that has become so commonplace, at least here in the UK, where somebody comes up to you, you have a retired hat or you have a, some, some indicator that you served and then somebody comes up to you and says, hey, thank you for your service. So I, I was writing some notes down and I, and Nick, you know, as sort of a, a younger military person, I always took the time to thank people like you that have served before me because my organization wouldn't be the same without having you uh, have laid that foundation, you know, in the years and the years and years uh, and your generation. So I guess this is my sort of way of thanking you for your service, for making my organization that I served in a, uh, a great one. And I, 
Yeah, uh, it's an interesting term, that isn't it? Because uh, it's a bit like have a good day. Uh, and I, whilst I'd rather someone said that than ignore a serviceman, uh, retired or otherwise, uh, I think it has become a little formulaic in the same way that wearing a poppy now is almost compulsory in this country. Uh, not to suggest that we should do anything else. I'm a, uh, the, the Poppy Foundation um, um, is so strong and of course the money it generates uh, helps uh, servicemen retired or otherwise uh, so much that it's, it's an essential part of our lives now. But I still think that uh, people should be able to pick and choose. Whereas I think if you look on our televisions, I think from about the beginning of November or just before, uh, it's like compulsory. Everybody on television wears a poppy. And I think that's, that, that's fine, but I don't think it should be a matter of shame if you don't, or if you've forgotten your poppy that day or whatever. Um, because there are undoubtedly people out there who feel that all aspects of conflict or war um, are immoral and that they don't want to support people who fought. Of course, I have the exact opposite view. I'm sure the same as you, and that uh, those people are allowed to express those views purely because we've had uh, generations of people who have fought for the values we hold so dear. So uh, much as I, uh, I cringe a little bit when people uh, say thank you for your service, I would much rather they came up and said, Oh, you served. What did you do? Um, and, uh, you know, I, we really appreciate it uh, and that sort of thing. So engage with someone, just even if it's only for a few seconds, rather than just make a passing comment like that and walk away thinking you've done your bit. Well, that being said, what, what motivated you to join the military? Well, that's an interesting question actually my 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 family's military my mother served uh, in the women women's auxiliary air force uh, during the war my father served as a as a second world war pilot and uh, of course i grew up in a generation where uh, all the adults around me uh, were ex um world war ii uh, veterans of one form or another either they lived in the country during uh, the blitz or or at least certainly during the war and they suffered the deprivations of the rationing and uh, the attacks that were being made on the country or they more likely actually served in the military in one form or another so uh, for me it was completely natural i grew up in a generation when if you heard the um you know god save the queen the national anthem being played you stood up and you stood still um, you know, when a, when a hearse went down the road, everyone stopped. And all the gents, because everyone wore hats in those days, would doff their hats. And that was a kind of a, a generation that taught me the manners that I still feel are important. Now things move, and I quite understand why. Uh, the wartime generation must seem an awful long way away to young people now. But with that in mind... Uh, being uh, military-minded was perfectly normal and natural. So joining the Air Training Corps, joining the Royal Air Force, although it wasn't my first way uh, I wanted to get into flying, it ended up as the ultimately the best way for me to become a pilot. Um, that was really the reason I had no worries about joining the Air Force. I, I did con was slightly concerned about the restrictions that were put on me. But in reality, of course, they're no more restrictive than you would get in any well-run airline. You're still going to wear a uniform. There's still a very strict <laughs> hierarchy. Um, you're not going to salute each other, but that's a small thing. You know, it's, uh, it's just the rules are slightly different, but still it's uh, very much a, an authoritative system of command from the top down to the bottom. Uh, and whilst CRM and our current, current attitudes towards mixing and matching people uh, on the aircraft have changed, and rightly so, to try and flatten that uh, authority uh, curve a little bit, uh, it still exists and it, would, it has to because of it. ultimately there's only one person on the aircraft that can make the final decision. So would you say that 
in your day-to-day life that is what you've taken away most out of your military service is you know going on to your career in the airlines and well, at yeah. least from a technical standpoint well from a technical and emotional the the military gave me um all the values that i hold dear i mean uh, when i joined the air force uh very soon after i pitched up on my first squadron i was uh, given the honor of bearing the squadron standard now RAF standard is a bit like a battle standard that the an army regiment would have in that it was a heavily embroidered uh, much revered flag that would stand proud on the battlefield and would be a rallying point to all the members of uh, that regiment uh, so that if ever they felt that they needed to gather around and defend their commanders that's the point they would move to and as such it was uh, you know, uh, very important, but also on it are usually the battle honours that that regiment have been awarded. And when I uh, became the standard bearer for 43 Squadron, I used to look at that flag and I used to go, wow, you know, the uh, the battle honours went all the way back to the First World War, uh, the Ypres and uh, the Somme, uh, you know, during the First World War. And then the Second World War, they fought in the Battle of Britain. They uh, fought over Italy during the landings in Sicily. And then as the, uh, as the Allied forces moved up through Italy, they participated in the air battles there. So that was, to me, was incredibly important. And uh, I remember uh, at one point I had to take the standard down to London to be repaired because over the years, uh, when you... A parade with this uh, big thing it's on about a six foot pole with a big golden eagle on top uh, and uh, you, you stop it from flapping around just by gently clasping the bottom corner of the flag against the pole so when you're standing with it that's what restrains it and of course that corner gets worn and it needed to be repaired and uh, I was a well, quite a young and junior officer uh, I was taking the train from Scotland down to London, where the only place in the United Kingdom where we have these things done is a tiny little tailor shop in Soho in London. And uh, I was given a first class rail warrant. Well, that was pretty impressive because I wasn't entitled to a first class rail warrant, uh, but the standard was. So the, stand, the standard traveled first class, and because I just had be the standard bearer I travel first class, first class <laughs> with it so, but um, we used to of course parade that uh, at many occasions and some of the most poignant were of course uh, on the Remembrance uh, Sunday parades where we were frequently parading in a big cathedral uh, often in uh, Edinburgh and uh, you know marching uh, quietly up the aisle with the all the other standards of other squadrons and units and uh, those that have been retired hanging on the walls of that cathedral just gives you an enormous feeling of the history of the unit that you are now part of yeah now we you've mentioned the the units honors and citations you must have served in so many places and seen so many things but is there one specific citation or recognition for yourself that that you're particularly proud of or, or well the, the there were no honors uh, while i was with the the squadron we never really um took part in any uh, operations so the honors sit on the on the squadron standard finished at the end of the second world war and um unfortunately our uh, in my experience, uh, I, the unit never moved on into an actual conflict. The Cold War wasn't considered a, a, an actual conflict. Um, but certainly, um, I used to look at it and think that the Battle of Britain was the most important in, in my mind. I, I mean, I remember it as a young cadet dressed up in my uniform. Uh, do you remember the movie, the original movie, The Battle of Britain? Uh, color it. Yeah, fabulous. And uh, we would be there with our um, tin cans collecting for uh, the British Legion and selling poppies uh, outside the cinemas when they had 
first had that film uh, released. Uh, so I had enormous memories of that. And of course, the iconic aircraft that flew were just so important to me. Every time I visited a museum, it was to go and see those World War II aircraft. And they're still uh, a very important uh, part of history that I'm fascinated in. But um, with regards to my service, uh, I guess the time that uh, is important to me personally uh, was when I was up at RAF Lucas flying the Phantom. Um, it was the closest we came to a truly operational role. But um, being up there also gave us unique opportunities because when I started serving uh, there in late 70s, there were still members of the squadron, ex-members of the squadron, uh, who had fought uh, with 43 Squadron in the First World War. Wow. And they would come up to our open day, where we had uh, annually, and uh, we would sit down beside them and talk to them over a whiskey or a cup of tea, perhaps, depending on, <laughs> on what time of the day it was, and uh, try and find out what it was like for them to serve in the First World War, and uh, let alone the Second World War. So... Uh, in fact, when I came to the squadron, uh, we had a master pilot. Now, he would have been equivalent rank of a warrant officer, so he was a non-commissioned officer. He was a Spitfire pilot, and he was still serving, uh, and he was actually serving as one of our operations personnel in the squadron ops area. Uh, and he was a wonderful chap. He wasn't flying anymore. And in fact, he said, although he started off his flying career uh, flying the Spitfire, he was a little bit after the Second World War, so he hadn't actually flown it during the war. But just having people like that around you just gives you an enormous feeling of gratitude for the time that you grew up mm -hmm. and that you actually managed to speak to these people face to face and, you know, just swap stories with them. Although I must admit, I did find it a little hard to connect between flying the Phantom and uh, <laughs> a, a, a sort with camel or yeah. whatever. <laughs> well, you know, what? just uh, earlier this year, I was down at Eglin Air Force Base and they are training test pilots that are generally either F-15s, F-16 test pilots or, or F-22. And they had a contract with the commemorative Air Force to bring a P-51. Oh, wow. And all of these test pilots would get a 30-minute, 45-minute ride in a P-51 to see how that aircraft handled and, and how aircraft and fighter aircraft specifically have evolved into these you know, fourth and fifth generation fighters. Um, so I thought that was, that was a great idea on, on behalf of the U.S. Air Force but you mentioned, so it really is about the people, isn't it? it you, you get to fly some pretty cool airplanes and you, and you get recognized for your service and this, but it, but it really is, it's that, that, that brotherhood, that uh, whatever, that, that closeness that you develop with your squadron mates and your service mates and then those people that, that you end up serving with and supporting isn't it? And, and you still keep in close touch with a lot of your squadron mates, don't you? Oh, very much so. Yeah, exactly. Um, you are right, because uh, when you are going off uh, to go and take part in an operation, uh, you're doing it with people you live and work with uh, all day, every day. So, you know, you are there helping to protect the man beside you, and he's doing the same for you. Uh, and the thought of queen and country um, are pretty remote in your mind because what your experience is something much more immediate um, and uh, what your boss or your commanders uh, up there at headquarters uh, are doing and thinking, well, that is really totally irrelevant. You're out there with a, with a mission and you are there to complete it and more importantly, you're there to do it with your your colleagues, uh, you know, uh, it, they call it the, the uh, profession of arms. Well, I think of it more as a brotherhood and it is your brothers on the squadron and sisters now because there are plenty of lady fighter pilots uh, around in the, uh, in the Air Force and in the world. Um, you, you are there with them uh, to work together as a team and that's, that's how you, uh, you face the dangers you do, knowing that you're going to do it together with your, the best friends you've ever made in the world. Uh, and 
you know, what the people think elsewhere is to a certain extent irrelevant. Yeah, it, it was always interesting for me to try to describe that feeling of deploying or conducting an operation or even just going on a humanitarian trip. And, and it is exactly what you're talking about because the specialized organizations that I was in, we were always on the road. We were always out in some other country. I think I ended up with something like 65 different countries that I traveled to on official business. And you relied on your squadron mates to not just be there for you, but to, to help you get out the door, but then you trusted them with your family. If, if I had an issue at home, many times I was not able to communicate or at least not in a timely manner. So I had to trust my squadron leadership and my squadron mates to be able to take care of, of my life while I took a step away for those couple of weeks or a couple of months. And uh, it really, they really do become your family. And I, I specifically remember one, my first deployment to Iraq, where I was working very, very closely with the British forces and, and uh, the British army flying their uh, Britain, Norman Islanders, the defenders. And I, I spent months with, with my, uh, my friends over there from RAF Odium. And uh, I made some lifelong friendships with British, British Army guys. Uh, and to this day, I, I keep in touch with them. And, and it really is just this, this uh, there's no better word than brotherhood when you're, when you're, and that is all inclusive. But when you're sitting there in, in some, some country living out of tents or containerized housing and eating cold eggs and cold coffee and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's amazing, isn't it? But you're right. It's those shared experiences and because they're such intense experiences, I think it really does. And because you, you do rely on each other just so much. Uh, I think it really does form a bond that is, uh, unequaled anywhere else. I mean, you do make lifelong friends, but many of them, um, you know, it's never the same as being with a colleague who you have uh, uh, fought with. Um, so, yeah, I understand entirely. So, Nick, how, how did you feel on your last day of service, your last day in uniform? But it's an interesting question because uh, uh, the reason, one of the reasons I came out was the feeling I had that I had slightly outgrown the military. I don't mean that in an arrogant way. Uh, what I mean is that uh, the, the military was shrinking and uh, they needed to shed people. And I was getting to the point where I had to either move my career uh, up the greasy pole uh, which would have meant sitting behind a desk for many years or continue flying in another way. And uh, I, I remember the time I made the decision and we were having yet another uh, war exercise, a three-day uh, tacky bow. And it was on day three and I was uh, there with my tornado. We were in a hardened aircraft shelter. The scenario was that uh, the uh, Soviets had dropped... Uh, well, the Russians, actually, because the Soviets didn't really exist by then, had dropped a nuclear weapon nearby. We were being uh, irradiated. We couldn't leave the Haz. We were uh, wearing uh, AR-5. Uh, if you, you may know what that is, but the, no one else probably will. It's a, it's a big rubber bag tight over your face with an integral um, oxygen, sorry, uh, respirator. That, um, you know, you have to wear when you're flying in these sort of conditions to filter out uh, all the air. And it's connected with a hose to a sort of big fan wearing handbag you have to carry beside. And there's a big procedure about connecting to the aircraft filtered uh, oxygen when you get on board and not breathing anything nasty. So we were sitting, I was sitting with this on uh, and it's hot and sweaty, even the fact that we we're in Scotland, uh, wearing the old charcoal suits and then an immersion suit, um, uh, sitting on the floor of this concrete has, which is a pretty 
uh, uncomfortable environment. And beside me were the ground crew wearing their respirators and my navigator. <laughs> and we were just looking at each other. And we'd been, we'd been in there for like four hours and nothing had happened. Uh, and I was just wondering at the age of 38 coming on, 39 what the hell i was doing <laughs> why am i doing this uh and uh that was kind of the point where i thought i probably outgrown this you know it, when, I, when i did it as a youngster uh it was all very exciting because exercise flying was very demanding it was the you know it was the closest you came to uh going off and fulfilling a, a proper wartime mission uh and you had all the top secret books in your pockets bulging out and everything was played for real um so uh, but but you know uh, 19 years later it didn't really feel the same so that was probably the point at which i had decided that it was time to move on but i did so with uh great regret because it was obviously for me the end of an era and I was stepping out of that huge family environment which was my extended family of my squadron mates and the, the base and uh, all the um, assistance they will provide you when you're in the Air Force mm -hmm. um, into a world where no one really gives two hoots about you. They just want your body to sit in an airplane and as long as you've got a license and a medical they'll pay you to fly. Uh, now, I realize there's, that's quite a, a trek to get to the position where you've mm -hmm. got someone who's willing to pay you. Uh, you've got to jump a lot of hoops to get to that position. But once you're in that cockpit and you've got an established job and you're with a company that's not likely to go bust tomorrow, then uh, really and honestly, you are, you're just selling your soul. You're selling your ability for money, which is fine. And uh, uh, the flying then... So suddenly stops being exciting it yeah. becomes mundane and yet you carry a lot of responsibility so to say it's mundane is uh, is probably um, treating it a bit too flippantly you do carry a lot of responsibility but the flying itself is uh, very straightforward and th that that change for me was remarkable and uh, i still look back at that those two different lives and treat them as two different parts of my life. One was very intense and uh, I look back, back with great uh, enthusiasm for the time and uh, a lot of uh, poignancy that it's gone by. And then there's my civil flying career, which I just look at as, oh, I just went out and got a job. And, <laughs> that, and that was it. That was 25 years of just doing a job, but that was really it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll be right there behind you following your footsteps and <laughs> making that transition. Yes, so, I know. You've, you've gone through that yourself now. So uh, you, you had what looked like a marvelous uh, retirement, uh, series of retirement parties and uh, a big event. So, I mean, did it bring tears to your eyes when you finally had to realize that it, you were leaving it all behind? Absolutely. Absolutely. When I when I was standing up on that stage and I, I chose to have my retirement at the Airborne and Special Operations Museum in Fayetteville, North Carolina, because I had spent the majority of my career in special operations. And when I didn't want to have one of those ceremonies where the person up on stage just drones on and on about, you know, some chronology, uh, I looked around and it was the the strangest feeling because it was uh it was like the old tv show this is your life i looked around and there was friends there from when i first came in and there were friends from my last assignment and there was former commanders and former supervisors and and most importantly there were people that showed up whom i had led so they there were young folks that uh that had made the trek to to watch you know their their boss basically transition and it w that was the most uh, special thing to me was just looking around and looking at the people that had showed up there and, and it was representative of everyone's career and how many lives you touch and especially you know especially towards the last 5 7 years or so I was I wasn't doing much flying either you know i was i was not a line flyer I, that was a young man's game and i didn't want to sit there in chem suits either <laughs> and uh and i was reminded 
of that every time I, I would go to a refresher class. And I, I, I was just telling my wife, <laughs> we had to do the parachute refresher class, which you jump off a platform that's, you know, 15 feet up and, and you have to do your parachute landing fall. And the, the instructor just looked at me and he said, sir, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know, I'll do it once, but I, I really appreciate the fact that you're able to recognize that I may fall apart when I hit, hit the ground <laughs> <laughs> and it's just going to result in, in more paperwork for you. So, so thank you. Um, you know, and, and that was just a funny moment to, to highlight to me that, that maybe I was, you know, right, right with you where, uh, you know, geez, I, but, but it was about the people. That's what I got to do for the last five years is just help uh, peers that were senior leaders and help so many young folks that, that were just looking for a little guidance and, and those folks showed up and absolutely it brought, it brought a tear to my eye and, and, and it was, it was scary. And I think it would be scary whether you, you serve four years, six years, 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years, and suddenly you find yourself on that last day. And, and it's almost like standing on the edge of a precipice where you can see what's on the other side, but, but you just aren't exactly sure how you're going to get there because you've had this incredible support network for, for your time in the service. And I guess Absolutely. That, that's reflected. Yeah, and, and when I look back on those uh, times uh, now, I, uh, I get a real lump in my throat for, for exactly the same reason. Um, but the lovely thing about finally uh, hanging up the flying boots uh, is that now I can spend more time um, digging into the areas of interest I have uh, about those times, whether it be in the stories I tell or just... Um, uh, going out and uh, selling poppies. Uh, my wife is a poppy seller, so she um, she goes out uh, uh, about this time with her tray of poppies and knocks on doors and encourages people to contribute. And uh, I was lucky enough um, when my father was uh, still pretty fit, uh, although uh, a little infirm, um, we. Uh, well, I accompanied him to uh, an Anzac Day, which, of course, is the Australian's equivalent of what we're all referring to, which starts at dawn, if I have to say. I was always impressed that they uh, they started so early. Um, and uh, he was there uh, as the guest of honor because it's not often, uh, you know, in recent years that, you know, you can find a, a Second World War pilot who's uh, who's still alive and kicking. So that was a great honor for me. I, I, I love that. Uh, and of course, I will continue to represent as best I can uh, the military and uh, whatever parades and things there are around um, because uh, I think it's important. And one of the reasons I love telling the stories I do when I give uh, aviation lectures is just to try and further um, you know, the feeling of uh, the importance of the military and how much you have to give. Uh, to be a member of it. Yeah. And you, in the UK, you all do such a, just a wonderful job of, of uh, remembering. And I've said this quite a few times. I, I, I've, I lived over there for six years total and, and I always went to Remembrance Day parades, uh, mostly in, in East Anglia. And, uh, it was just amazing to me that the number of folks that come out and support and the poppies and, and the, and the parades themselves. And, and then you go into some thousand year old church and you have a, an incredibly reflective service where, where there's veterans sitting there and, and it's not just the veterans. It is all those, especially in the UK, you know, the whole country has experienced just immense challenges, not, not just the folks in uniform and those folks being in that, in that same church shoulder to shoulder with, with those that went forward. Uh, I just, it was always just such a great celebration. Um, 
that 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 you guys do in the UK, and I was always honored to be part of it as a U.S. Air Force unit participating. Well, of course, uh, where you were was the home of so many uh, U.S. units during the Second World War who did such brave things. So um, it must have been doubly uh, poignant. I don't know if you get a chance to visit any of the old airfields that were now turned into pig farms or whatever, but I can imagine what it would be like if you were a uh, a guy who had served uh, around there and uh, you came back to tr see if there was anything left of your old base. It must be, would have been quite amazing. But what I love is that the, um, the organizations that we have that do such a good job of uh, continuing uh, to support the members of the forces are doing so and reminding people that uh, since now and the end of the Second World War, British forces have only uh, stopped uh, being on uh, actual operations for about a week uh, in that there's always, almost continually, uh, British servicemen who are putting their lives at risk on actual operations almost every day of every year since the, uh, since the Second World War, which is quite incredible considering our commitment to the military is, is generally speaking, uh, reducing, which I, I find uh, worrisome, but that's a completely different subject. The fact that we can look back at aviators from the Korean War, in your case from the uh, Vietnam War, and then uh, the subsequent operations uh, in the Middle East uh, just brings to our mind, and, and of course some of the injuries that the servicemen have suffered, uh, means that we regularly see uh, people uh, who are still alive and coping with life, but uh, dreadfully maimed. Uh, and that, you know, brings a new aspect to our support for them, which makes all these, this, the, this, the, the 11th, the 11th, all the more important to us, because it just brings to everyone's focus uh, how important it is to remember what's happened to the people who went before us. Yeah. And after Good. us. I couldn't have said it any better. And uh, as we close in on this Remembrance Day and this Veterans Day, uh, Nick, I, you know, I thank you for your service. And like you said, those that served before us and those that are currently serving and uh, those that will serve uh, after us. So thank you so much for taking your time to, uh, to be with me this morning. Oh, it's been absolutely my pleasure. Um, we all, when we put our hand up and uh, place our, uh, you know, make a, a promise. Uh, my my case, my um, uh, when I got my commission, uh, the hand on the Bible, hand in the air, and I, I promised to give uh, my life to my country and my queen. Um, then it is a very important moment, and the fact that there are people still doing it and fulfilling that uh, promise they made to help defend their country and defend our ideals uh, wherever they are in the world, I think is uh, truly remarkable. And uh, just, um, you know, uh, I, I'm in awe of those who continue to serve and so thankful that they do. That's great. Thank you, Nick. Uh, my pleasure. I mean, what a what a fascinating chat that was. I mean, you can't beat two um, sort of well, one now ex. Well, in fact, they're both ex. Uh, you know, serving personnel. I mean, serving um, yeah. a really interesting uh, chat. Nice to get sort of uh, perhaps a different take on 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 how we all feel. I know with uh, you know Armistice Day, Remembrance Day, Veterans Day, whatever you know, depending on where you are in the world as to what you call it. But uh, yeah, no, thank you, Armando and uh, Nick, obviously for that interview. Sadly, Armando has had to leave us. Uh, he's got to go and fly a Cessna. Is that correct? Is that what he was flying? Did he say? Possibly. <laughs> right. Okay. Thanks for that. I do love a pregnant pause. Thanks. <laughs> Actually, I was going to say going going back to going back to that piece you just played, Matt. Yeah. Even for me, I mean, I had a really, really busy, busy day yep. on on that particular day at work. But even me, I was on my own in the warehouse, and I have to say, I, I had the radio on, and even I stopped yep. what I was Absolutely. doing. Absolutely, I did. I was Dead, totally stopped. 
Uh, what what was nice actually? I I was um, doing a, a swimming contract uh, uh, that day because obviously it was the Monday uh, here in the UK um, that Armistice Day fell, which is the eleventh of the eleventh. Obviously, we were we were actually I say I was doing a swimming contract, and what was interesting is that the co- the, the 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 school that were having their swimming lesson, they all got out of the pool and they stood on the side of the uh, swimming pool. To for one minute to you know as a mark of respect to, to those and I just thought uh, how nice it is that that like the younger generation are still having it sort of instilled into them the mm. importance of of remembering those who fought for what we take for granted I, I just thought it was a, a lovely ta- touch uh, worth mentioning actually also there is uh, some more of that interview because um, I actually took the liberty if you like of asking some few uh, a few more questions and that's actually going to be coming on uh, sort of uh, to at the end of uh, December so uh, uh, a little bit more to look forward to with that uh, in in the coming weeks so for those of you who watch the show you may already probably know that uh, tomorrow morning me and Neville will be getting up uh, quite early and uh, heading off to London Heathrow for a flight uh, on BA on their new A350-1000 off to Dubai for the air show, which opens this coming Sunday. Uh, It's on for a week. Uh, Me and Nev are going to be there on Sunday and Monday as well, uh, interviewing various people within the aviation industry, not just pilots, but kind of people from all realms of the aviation industry. Yeah, it's a big big business event, isn't it, Mm -hmm. Uh, really there? So, yeah, we're looking forward to that. So uh, we'll be uh, jetting off tomorrow, uh, tomorrow afternoon, actually, we'll fine, don't we? Yeah. Yes, and, just after lunch. Uh, just yeah. after lunch. And uh, thoroughly looking forward to it, actually. Uh, this will be my first um, flight on a A350. Um, and Nev, you've, you've flown on the 900. Yeah, yeah 900 with Finnair. Mm. Uh, but uh, more importantly, apart from you know the A350-1000 and the Dubai Air Show, the highlight of tomorrow is going to be as it always is, the Heathrow T5 pod personal oh. transport thing. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this. Nev, Nev has been showing me what this whole pod thing's about. Oh. It, uh, it looks awesome. It's, it's brilliant. It's a fairground ride. <laughs> it's brilliant. Well, I, and uh, no, I, I no. think that the, the thing is with it that there's, I don't think there's, I think I'm right in saying it, Heathrow's got the, is the only place in Europe that's operating it and it's really really good apart from when it breaks down which is not ideal uh, as did happen to me oh, one no. <laughs> night coming back from Edinburgh uh, but um, no it's it's a really good way it's just a five minute ride on it to, to the terminal from the car park but it's a great job actually well so I don't I'm listening I can say do- Dr. St- oh, oh, oh. Dr. Steph says, ha-ha, I've always wanted to ride uh, said pod. Uh, Auntie Liz says that I've been in the pod with Nev. It's great. Yes, I, oh, I have yeah. taken Liz on the pod. Yeah. Uh, she says, I usually go past, uh, sorry, Dr. Steph says, I usually go past it on the rental, on the rental car shuttle, as you do. Uh, We're easily <laughs> pleased, aren't we? That's yeah, nice. indeed. And actually, while anyone, uh, oh, go on. If anyone's listening, though, for uh, listening to the show, who may well be in the area of Heathrow Airport tomorrow morning, after, early afternoon, yeah, look out for us. We'll be uh, there. Indeed. Probably in the in the uh, lounge. Yes, we were going to try out the, the bacon rolls and the BA lounge. Right. Making, oh, quality sure control. Up to standard. Yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Quality yes. control, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, to, to actually, before we, we're going to start wrapping up now, but uh, before we do that, I just wondered, uh, guys, if you wouldn't mind me just uh, saying thank you to lots and lots of people. Obviously, oh, yes. uh, the people that I said thank you to uh, last week all that, that were all in that wonderful card um, that I had um uh, last week uh, with the biggest surprise I've ever had in my life but also uh, uh, thank you to Dave Willis as well and uh, if, if you'll indulge me we actually had an email uh, come in this week uh, that was to do with that and it was uh, for, from uh, Nick Colding who said uh, good afternoon PT UK from down here in sunny Devon I've been listening to the show for about 18 months or so now having come across f- uh, having come across from those reprobates at APG I was going to say transatlantic 
reprobates, but at least we have Captain Nick keeping balance. Uh, aside from saying a big thank you for tirelessly producing an excellent show every week, I would just like to say how incredibly touched I was to hear the stories of the two mats this week. Uh, I was listening while driving to work, and I can honestly say that not only did I get a bit choked up, but I think I might even have got a bit of grit in my eye. All for a couple of guys I've never met. Although I'm very much in denial of my passing years, it's easy to become cynical and jaded about life sometimes. I got to, I, I got to say uh, that what was achieved for these two blokes is absolutely remarkable, and it is really did show that, that ultimately what really matters to us is our fellow man and woman, and doing our best to take care of those around us in the best way we can a huge bravo to all those who pitched in and did something so remarkable uh, what you achieved and and have undertaken is something quite wonderful and immensely heartwarming much love to you all nick oh, what a lovely email that was so thank you very much yeah. nick for nice. for taking the time to send that in and really as i say that that uh, very much sort of matches my sentiments of of uh, what last week had as well not only to me obviously but uh, you know matt uh, bf obviously had a a, a very very um moving story obviously about how come mm. he was uh, in charlotte um seeing armando and things and uh yeah it's just been for it's it, it we love this we love this community don't we um, yes we do. certainly do, we do. Indeed. Yeah. it uh it, you know it, i still i still think back now to when we we started the ball rolling and uh you know the donations mm. came in and i was just sick my phone was ping 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 just constant with uh yeah. with stuff coming in i was just you know I, I right then i wanted to go matt 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 look look but i just couldn't do it so i had to keep it quiet but um, i know yeah, i know which i did i yes, succeeded absolutely yes i should never trust you ever again uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh guys well we know what you're up to next week obviously because you're, you're off to a certain air show um anything else uh, outside of air show have you got to look forward to next week going anywhere glamorous well, nev um i'm going to dublin the moment i get back from dubai uh i'm coming back home quick change of clothes and then back out to dublin the following day actually oh, so lovely. uh it's going to be another a bit of a quick turnaround, as they say. But, yeah, uh, indeed. Looking we'll see an uh, airline of choice. Uh, well, I, oh, sorry, I, sorry, sorry, <laughs> Carlos. You need to ask that question. BA next, uh, and uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yes, uh, a bit of a hectic week trying to squeeze five days' work into two and a half. Two and a half. Okay, so yeah, that's yeah. the plan. And, and uh, uh, you, Carlos, Carlos, where are you off to? You busy? Yeah, when I get back from uh, Dubai, I'm having a day off just to sort of recoup get over and then thursday i'm back to work where i'm going to have a trip down to the wonderful place that is matt's favorite place london and i will be heading down to the olympia oh lovely um, you, you have a lovely time now won't you huh. and i'm really <laughs> looking forward to it uh, okay good he says putting his fingers in his throat for those listening on the audio yeah. podcast brilliant yes yeah i just have to remind you yeah. i love driving in london Matt. <laughs> do you okay yes all right yes i mean oh. i've done it i've done it for a number of years i feel your pain i've got uh, one trip of note this week uh, i'm off to cambridge which is my favorite place to go so i'm very much looking forward to that i think that's actually on friday of next week so i'm looking forward to doing that uh right uh, we need to wrap up then guys because you have a yeah. plane to catch so that is where we are going to bring episode number 294 to a close. Big thanks to everyone who's joined us in the YouTube chat room this evening. Not forgetting as well, everyone who downloads the show as an audio podcast as well. Don't forget to contact the show. You can contact us through the usual means, through uh, WhatsApp and uh, our email address, podcast at plaintalkinguk.com. Send us uh, your feedback in through there. And uh, Matt, just quickly, before we go, what is that WhatsApp number? Which yeah, listeners can so it is so it's plus four four seven five seven double two four nine one six six and you can also send voice notes through that as well uh so why not leave us a voice message that we can then play out on the show so that's plus four four seven five seven double two four nine one double six so that's it then guys and girls have a great weekend whatever you're doing enjoy your sunday roast so from me carlos here with nev in the nev tech studios in buckinghamshire it's goodbye See you guys. Have a nice week and a weekend as well. And from me, it is time to say goodbye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>